So we're going to start with a discussion of thermodynamic systems. Um, you know, usually you have, this is just a very sort of general discussion, usually you have the system and the surroundings. A typical system might be, uh, for, th for thermodynamics, something we might actually work with in class, might look like this. This is a container of some kind, and maybe you'll have a piston in here, right? And then you'll have a gas inside. I'll make it a blue gas. So, you know, um, maybe in here is my system. This is my boundary. And this is my surroundings. I could be, for example, compressing this, uh, this piston or something, doing work on the gas. Something like that. Closed system is isolated from its surroundings. An open system interacts. Usually that means exchanges energy. So uh, the, the zeroth law of thermodynamics, which was written after the first law, which we'll do next, um, states that if object one is in thermal equilibrium with object two and with object three, then objects two and three are in thermal equilibrium with each other. Um, or if, uh, if T1 equals T2 and T1 equals three two, T3, then T2 equals T3. Uh, this is basically a statement about uh, thermal equilibrium, right? The temperature is the same throughout a region where there, that's, that's in thermal equilibrium. So we'll talk about equations of state in thermodynamics. Uh, these are uh, equations um, involving state variables. So it could be, um, it could be, you know, like the pressure, the temperature, temperature, volume. So you can write some function that's a function of the pressure and the temperature and the volume equals zero, and that would be an equation of state. Right? And so the ideal gas law, PV minus nRT equals zero, is a state equation. Um, we talked about before uh, um, instance of variables are independent of amount. So, for example, pressure and temperature. If I take a sample of gas in the room, I can take the temperature here. And if the room's in thermal equilibrium, then the temperature is the same wherever I go. It doesn't matter how much air I take the temperature of. Same thing with the pressure. Extensive pr variables depend on amount. So the volume, the mass, things like that. 
total energy. So in this section, we're going to look at the, <coughs> the work done on or by a gas. And eventually we'll start talking, relating it to um, heat and internal energy. So I'm going to start with um, uh, just our definition of work. If you remember work is equal to force times distance times the cosine of the angle between them. In the context of a gas, we're usually going to be thinking of it in terms of like a, a, a cylinder. Let me draw it this way. All right, a closed cylinder that's got a piston on the side. So here's my piston. Right, like that, and then somewhere inside here, I have uh, I have a gas. Now maybe this p piston has area A, and I have pressure P in here, and so that means that the force exerted on the piston is equal to the pressure times the area, right? Now if the piston moves, let's say it goes this way, right, and so that later on it's here. So we'll call this position one and this position two, right? It's been pushed back. Then that means the piston has exerted a force in this direction. And uh, um, uh, the piston has changed position. And so um, we would say the gas does work on the piston, right? It exerts a force in that di direction, which is the pressure times the area, and uh, the piston moves that distance. The work done is equal to the force times the distance. Since it's moving in the direction it's, it's being pushed, I don't have to worry about the cosine theta. That's just uh, F times uh, delta X, which is just the pressure um, times the area times delta X. But the area times delta x is just uh, the volume that's been swept out by the piston, right? It's the volume enclosed in this piece of the cylinder here, and so that's p delta v. Uh, if we were to write this in a more calculusy way and just look at a tiny increment, we would say w is equal to p dv. Sorry, dw is equal to p dv. And that's really a better way to look at it than this one, because this kind of assumes, that what I wrote here kind of assumes that the pressure is constant the whole time, and it's probably not. As this thing is expanding, the pressure is probably uh, changing in here, maybe declining, unless I'm heating it in there somehow. And so usually you see the work done for a gas instead of written this way, written that way. Now, if, the, if, if it started in this position, then, then the gas is having work done on it because the gas is pushing that way, but the piston is going this way. And so we would say work is being done on the gas in this direction or work is being done by the gas in this direction. Um, you can have, you can talk about negative work being done by the gas, and that means work is done on the gas. So, um, so we'll do some examples. So if I want to integrate this, I could say the work done is equal to the integral of dW, right? And that's equal to the integral of P dV. And I might say, you know, from 1 to 2, 1 to 2, like that. And the pressure might be different when the piston is in position 1 to position 2. Um, and so we're going to be evaluating this at various times. Uh, this is work done by gas going from 1 to 2. Right? We could uh, write this as the ideal gas law and we could say look P is equal to nRT over V and then this would become W is equal to the integral from 1 to 2 of nRT I didn't leave myself enough room there, so I'll just erase that little piece. Uh, NRT over V dV, if I wanted to. All right, I could write it that way. And then I can say,
if the temperature is constant for this process, in other words, if the process is isothermal, then T is constant, N is constant, because it's how much gas is trapped in there. Then I'll get that W is equal to the integral from one, to, sorry. W is equal to NRT times the integral from one to two of dV over V. That's what this becomes. Well, that's just equal to, I'm out of room, so I'll just write it up here. W is equal to NRT times the evaluation at one and two of log of V. So that's the work done by a gas that's expanding in an isothermal process. I'll, I'll, uh, on the next screen, I'll do some more examples of how to calculate the work done for various processes. So we're going to talk about work done by a gas for various processes, and I'm just going to give you some, some, uh, some easy ones. And so um, I'm going to take a gas. Let's say um, it's at, it's at uh, position A and then position B. And here's position C. And here's position D. Um, we already looked at, uh, uh, ooh, that wasn't very good. So an isothermal process looks like this, uh, P equals nRT over V. For an isothermal process, um, this is a constant, and so the pressure just goes as 1 over V, and so it looks like some kind of uh, a hyperbola, right? Um, so if I call this, uh, um, well, so This process is isothermal, going either direction, either that way or that way. Um, this process is isobaric. Constant pressure. Um, B to C is isometric, um, sometimes called isochoric. Constant volume. Right? So going from B to C, or C to B, or A to D, or D to A, um, is, uh, is isobaric. And the same thing with C to D. C to D, or D to C, is again isobaric and uh, D to A. is isometric. So the work going from A to B is just the integral from A to B of, uh, of uh, P dV. Well, going from A to B, the pressure is constant, right? We can call that, if we want to, we can call that PA equals PB, right? They're all in a horizontal line, and so this is just PA or PB times the integral from A to B of uh, dV, right? But this is just VA, and this is VB, and it's just a constant, and so uh, the work going from A to B is equal to the pressure at A times uh, VB minus VA. This is what you would expect because it's just the pressure, the, the, the integral of PDV is just the area under this curve. That's what that integral is. If the integral of, of, of a curve on Y versus X is just the integral of F of X dX. Uh, uh, that's just PDV in this case. And so, so it's real simple. When the line's horizontal, my pressure is constant, and my change in volume I just get by subtracting. And so that's the work going from A to B. The work going from B to C is uh, 
integral from B to C of P dV. Now here the pressure is varying, but guess what? dV is zero if I'm going from here to here, and so that's just zero. No work is done, right? And since my dV is zero, since nothing moves, it doesn't matter that the pressure changes, right? In order to have a F dx, the dx is in this dV, if there's no change in volume, um, the, there's no motion and no work is being done. If I go from C to D, right, the work going from C to D is uh, the integral from C to D of, uh, I can call this pressure C equals pressure D right, of uh, P dV. And that's equal to um, that's equal to the pressure. Say at d, either one of those is is fine because it's constant. Times the integral from c to d of dv, and this is equal to the pressure at d times the the volume at d minus the volume at c. Notice um, this is we've been calculating the work done by a gas, but now work going from c to d, the work done by the gas is negative. That's say that's to say, the volume here, the volume at A or the volume at D, they're the same, right? Is smaller than the volume at C, right? Volume increases this way, and so VD minus VC is negative, and that means the gas is doing negative work, and that's because the gas is being compressed by a force from the outside, and so that's less than zero and the gas is doing negative work. Going back to here, that's still zero work done. And so those are, so we've looked at isothermal processes, which we looked at on the last screen. And then we looked at isobaric processes and isometric processes, also called isochoric, right? So if you have a, if you have an isobaric process, it's easy to calculate the work done. It's just the pressure times the change in volume. Um, in an isometric process, the, the, the work done is zero. In an isothermic process, it's that log function. And there are a few others. We can actually calculate the, the work done if this is a straight line at an angle, because I'm just taking the area under, under a line. And so that one's doable also. Uh, we don't have a name for that process, a specific name, like isobaric or isometric or isochoric. So those are some examples of how work is done on a gas and what their sort of their functional form looks like. So the internal energy of a thermodynamic system um, is what we're going to talk about here. The internal energy, E internal, is the sum of the mechanical energies of, of the mechanical energies of all the particles. And so you can write it this way: uh, the internal energy of a gas is the sum from I equals one to n of Ke sub I plus U sub I, where Ke is the kinetic energy of the ith particle, and U sub I is the potential energy of the ith particle. So Ke equals the kinetic energy. And uh, U is equal to the potential energy. Um, the, the, the catch is this is the potential energy relative to the other particles. So, you know, in, when we're doing classical mechanics, we're talking about uh, potential energy relative to the Earth. We're not really interested in that when we're talking about the internal energy. This would just be energy stored in spring-like bonds between two particles or long-range forces between two article, particles or something like that. It's not um, the way we think of potential energy in a, in a gravitational sense. Um, and so these are internal energies. What's going on between the particles here and what's the kinetic energy of the particles here? The kinetic energy can also be a little more complicated than you think, because normally we think of usually the kinetic energy is one half mv squared. But we know that um, that you can also have rotational motion, and so you can have uh, one half i omega squared for a molecule that's, that can tumble, right? 
Um, you can also have a vibrational motion as the molecule is vibrating. So this can be more complicated than just one half mv squared. But if we look at a simple, um, for a non-interacting monatomic gas, in that case, the internal energy is just equal to the sum over all the gases of all the kinetic energies. Because if they're not interacting, there's no relative to potential energy between the particles. Right. <coughs> and so this is just equal to the sum i equals 1 to n of uh, 1 half m sub i v sub i squared. But if all the atoms have the same mass, I don't really need an m sub i there, right? I can just look at the v sub i. Usually we'll just be using the average velocity here, and so we might just write this as uh, sum from i equals 1 to n of 1 half m v squared from, for the internal energy of a monatomic gas. Like I said, as the molecules get more complicated and you allow more interactions, this internal energy gets more and more complex. But for a simple non-interacting mon monatomic gas, the uh, internal energy is just the kinetic energy, the sums of the kinetic energies of all the particles. Since we said uh, 1 half m v squared is 3 halves uh, um, kt, then um, we can say that the internal energy is equal to um, 3 halves n kt for the for the whole gas or three halves n rt. So this is the total internal energy of a gas that has three degrees of freedom and is just undergoing translational motion. There's no rotational motion. A, a rigid a diatomic molecule that was not interacting. In other words, it had uh, uh, in addition to being able to move around, it could also rotate along two axes, right? This way, sorry, it could rotate this way and this way. That would give it two more degrees of freedom. The internal energy would be five halves nRT, or five halves in nKT. It's the number of degrees of freedom over two times nKT, or little nRT. Um, it gets larger, again, if you allow for potential energies and things like that.